All right, I'm going to choke back some tears, and I'm really not sure what's left to say this morning after that. Uh, Could we just give it up for Devin one more time? That was... You know, ultimately, we're at church to, to just preach the gospel. Man, you just heard it right there. Um, I don't know what your story is. Um, that's not my story, but uh, wow, I've had some low moments in my life. Um, and I am so grateful. Matt and I just said it a second ago. So grateful for God's forgiveness and just his redemption. Um, that he is a restorer of broken things. And um, wow, what, a, what an incredible testimony. Um, all right. Um, as we continue on in our series, The Upside Down Gospel, um, we're going to take a look at primarily two chapters, two, two pieces of text today, Acts 16 and Acts 17. Originally, I was going to try to get all the way through Acts 20, and that was a joke. Um, there's just way too much uh, to get through, um, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive in, and I'll give you the title. If I was gonna put a title on this message, the title of this message is "What is your Troas?" What is your Troas? That's the title of today's message. But let me just set the stage for you real quick. So in Acts chapter 15, at the very first part of Acts chapter 15, we have this thing called the Jerusalem Council. Now, the Jerusalem Council, paraphrasing here, was when the elders of the church, the apostles of the church, they got together. They had some great debate to talk about, like, how are we going to bring together Jewish culture and Gentile culture as the gospel has now reached both? And there were some people who believed in Jesus, some Jewish people who believed in Jesus, but they said, hey, in order to really fully, truly be saved, you got to convert to Judaism. And one of the things that you got to do is you got to get circumcised. And so there was great debate about this amongst the people. And so we had this thing called the Jerusalem Council. Ultimately, they settled on a, a handful, three, three or four rules that you had to follow. And one of them was you didn't have to be circumcised to be saved. Um, so thank goodness for that, especially for the gentlemen back in this time who uh, were of the Gentile uh, ethnicity. So um, that's the first part of chapter 15. The second part of chapter 15 is an argument. And that argument happens between Paul and his ministry partner, Barnabas. Now, I, I didn't know that Paul really got into an argument, but I guess looking back uh, at some things, you, you kind of go, yeah, Paul was a pretty strong-willed guy. Probably put, took a pretty strong-willed guy to do the things that Paul did. And, and, and at the end of chapter 15, Paul is about to begin his second missionary journey. He's been on one missionary journey, which started in about 47 AD, and there were very few, if any, churches at the places Paul traveled. And 10 years later, about 57 AD, he's going to start his second missionary journey. And so he's piled up with Barnabas, and they're talking about, hey, let's go back. Let's visit the places where we started some churches 10 years ago. Let's see how they're doing. Let's encourage them. Let's get to work. And Barnabas says, yeah, let's go. By the way, I want to bring my cousin, John Mark, with me on the mission. And Paul says, "Uh uh-uh, no, 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 not not so fast. John Mark ain't coming. Because back in Acts 13, when we were trying to get some work done, your cousin decided he he had to go home in the middle of the work. And for... Whatever reason, apparently Paul took that real personally and saw it as a weakness. And we read in the text, there was great contention and debate here. There's some strong language. And ultimately what happens is Paul and Barnabas agree to separate ways. Barnabas grabs his cousin John Mark and they head to Cyprus. Paul gets with Silas and they set off on their own missionary journey. And so that gets us into the text of chapter 16. And so the first part of chapter 16, Paul meets Timothy. So Paul and Silas roll up to Lystra and Derby. By the way, two places that had not been kind to Paul in previous journeys. Paul writes in the scriptures that he was stoned three times. Lystra was one of those times. So he's back in a place where he was previously stoned. And they meet Timothy. Now, Timothy 
young man, comes from a multi-ethnic household. His mother was Jewish, his father was Greek, but he's a follower of the way and spoken of quite highly by the believers there. And I just think, little side note, kind of funny, the first thing they do when they meet Timothy is say, hey, one, you're coming with on the second missionary journey, and two, you got to get circumcised. And I just thought it was kind of funny because one chapter before, they just made this big thing about how you didn't have to get circumcised. But Paul decides and ultimately convinces Timothy, you need to get circumcised because it was still an issue with the people around in that community. And so to just take it off the table, they decide, Timothy, if you want to come with, you got to get circumcised. Let's just take the issue off the table. Let's move forward in our missionary journey. He gets circumcised. They move forward. And then they start going around and telling everybody, hey, by the way, one of the things you don't have to do to be saved is get circumcised. Again, I just think it's really funny. <laughs> um. I'll tie that into a point, though, uh, just real quickly. Are there things in your life and in my life that maybe we could put aside, we could not talk about, we could, like, give less preference to that cause an issue between people that we want to be and should be sharing the gospel with? Definitely don't stand down from truth. Like God's truth is God's truth and there's always a place for God's truth and that's all the time. But how it's delivered, when it's delivered, where it's delivered, all of that really matters. My dad used to tell me when I was a kid, what sounds better? Your beauty makes time stand still or your face could stop a clock. I'll just leave that sitting there. So they meet Timothy, okay? Timothy ultimately becomes super important to Paul. He writes two letters to Timothy. He calls Timothy his son in the faith. Um, later, as Paul is writing, he addresses six other letters. And in those letters, he's like, hey, from Paul and Timothy, Paul becomes really important in the ministry of Paul. Okay, that's the setup. I think it only took 15 minutes to do that. All right, so we get to the Macedonia call. Pay attention here. So we're in, we're in chapter 16, starting in verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. In a vision appeared to Paul in a night, a man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, Immediately, we, keep that in mind, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here's the picture. Paul and Silas are moving from east to west, evaluating where they should go share the gospel. The first place they try to go is Asia. Not Asia, Asia, like Asia Minor. Today, modern day Turkey. These are places like Ephesus, Colossae, Sardis, Smyrna, places you've, you've, you've heard about and read about in the Bible, but it says the Holy Spirit won't let them. So they turn north and try to go to Bithynia, but Holy Spirit says no again. So they wind up wandering down to Troas, which is just this little port city, and they're, and they're hanging out there, figuring, like, where should we go? And I got to think, like, Here's Paul. He just had an argument with his good missionary buddy Barnabas. He's tried to go to Asia. God says no. He's tried to go to Bithynia. God says no. He winds up in this rando place called Troas. And he's hanging out there wondering, like, what, where, 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 where am I going? And I bet if you were to ask Paul, where's God leading you in your life right now, Paul? What's God doing in your life? Paul would have said, Honestly, man, I have no idea. I just had an argument. I tried to go here. No, tried to go here. No. And now I'm here and I'm just like, I don't, I don't really know where I'm supposed to be headed. And I, I, there's, a, there's a great pastor that I love to listen to. I love how he puts this. And that is that Paul is learning an important lesson, one that hopefully you and I have learned and will continue to learn. And that is that God's no is just as important as God's go. God leads us 
through open doors. He leads us through closed doors. We should use discernment to understand, like, just how hard should I bang on that door to try to open it? Because it might be God saying, don't go there. Psalm 37 says that the Lord orders the steps of the righteous man. That's all steps. He orders the steps that we do take. He orders the steps that we don't take when we're walking in his path and down his direction. So it begs the question, what stopped Paul from going? It just says the Holy Spirit stopped Paul. Well, there's a couple of different theories out there. This one I find interesting, so I'll share it, I'll share it with you. We know that Paul struggled with sickness. He had some eye disease. He had, he, had some, he had some sickness challenges. And earlier in Acts, we see that he stays in Galatia for longer than he was planning to originally stay in Galatia. And the people there take care of him. And something interesting happens in the text here in verse, uh, in, in, in verse 10. It says, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go. So the text in verse 6 went from they to in verse 10, we. Who wrote, who wrote the book of Acts? Remind me. What did, what did Luke do? He was a physician. Maybe, we don't know, God used some sickness and ultimately brought Luke along as to be a, a, a part of Paul's missionary journey to get them to the next places. We, we, don't, we don't know, but could be. Interesting one. So Paul has this vision. It's the vision of the Macedonian man, and he says, we got to go. So once he has this vision, immediately, like, we got we to get, get on the move. So they make it to Macedonia. The first thing that happens is not much. They run into a woman named Lydia, who's a woman of resources. She does pretty well for herself. Um, but what we can gather from the text in verse 13, it says, And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So what you can learn from that piece of text is that there ain't much going on there as it relates to the Jewish faith and the gospel. Why? Because Jewish law said that in any place where there were 10 men or more who were believers, there needed to be a structure built for you to enjoy the Sabbath in. And there wasn't. They're hanging out with some ladies by the river. And they have some prayer. Ultimately, Lydia goes on to be converted. She's a woman of resources. She's got a house. She invites them to come back to the house to hang out, to get some sustenance. And Paul and Silas continue and Luke continue their missionary journey. Well, what happens next? Well, Paul, like in pretty much every city, it seems like he went to, winds up in prison. So follow along in the text. So Starting in verse 16, it says, And as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. So she was demon-possessed. And her owners gained much fortune uh, by, through her fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Correct. And this she kept doing for many days. But Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out. And it came out of her. When the owners, skip ahead, when the owners found out that their realization of profit was gone as this girl no longer was demon possessed and she couldn't tell the future, they got really mad. They drug Paul, Silas, Luke into the city. Ultimately, they're beaten with rods. And they're thrown into the innermost, innermost, innermost part of the prison. So here Paul is in prison. I do think it's interesting that what this girl was saying was accurate. I mean, it, she wasn't like counter-proposing what Paul and the gang were saying. I mean, it was true, but Paul wasn't going to let Satan do his advertising. It was a distraction. So he set this girl free from her demon possession and ultimately winds up beaten and thrown in jail. And I have to imagine that Paul, at least for me, kind of be a little, little bit of a low point. Like, man, God, you know, I, again, got in an argue with my friend. 
you told me no, you told me no again. Then I have this vision. I wind up in Macedonia and I meet some ladies by the river. One of them's converted, so I mean, that's good. But now here I am in, in prison. What happens next? Well, we know that an earthquake happens. Paul and Silas start singing at midnight. I don't know that I would be singing. In fact, I know that I probably wouldn't be singing because I've been in a few low points, not in uh, a prison beaten for sharing the gospel, thankfully. Um, But I've been in some low points, and my first reaction wasn't to uh, wake up in the middle of the night and sing praises to Jesus. It was more like, God, I'm trying to do what you want me to do, trying to be the guy that you want me to be, and it's just this after this after this after this. Like, what am I doing wrong? And I think one thing we can learn from Paul's life is that, you know, honestly, and this is something that I've been asking myself lately, it's like, man, things are pretty good right now. Like, reverse psychology, am I doing, am I, am I actually doing it right? Because what I see in Scripture over and over and over again is that, like, when you're really sold out for the gospel, life's not perfect. So when your life is perfect, like praise God for the blessings, but at the same time, like introspect a little bit and go like, hmm, you know, am I really doing what I should be doing for the, for the Lord? So they sing, there's an earthquake, the chains fall off, and they all run out of the jail and they're free. No, that's not, that's not, what, happens at, that's not what happens at all, actually. The Philippian jailer wakes up from his slumber and he goes, oh gosh, all these guys are, everybody's escaped and he's about, he's about to kill himself. And Paul says, uh, no, hold on, we're all here. Don't, don't do that. The Philippian jailer immediately recognizing something much bigger than himself has just happened um, says, what must I do to be saved? We see this in, in verse 28. It says, Paul, Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, well, you need to join a local church. You need to start tithing. You need to get on the ministry team, sign up for parking lot duty. Oh, wait, no, he didn't say that. He said the gospel as clearly as it could be said. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Paul uses this moment where the chains fall off, there's an earthquake, there's confusion. He could have jetted, escaped, but that's not what he did. He sat tight, shares the gospel with this Philippian jailer. That same hour, that same night, the Philippian jailer takes them from the jail to his house. The Philippian jailer cleans up their wounds He shares the gospel with their family. His whole family is converted. Now, just a quick side note, there's been some confusion about this verse over the the years, like, you know, some kind of perverted view of it that, like, when Paul says you and your family, that, like, because the Philippian jailer was saved, that automatically the family was saved. That's not true. That's not, that's not biblical at all. I think Paul was, was doing one of two things here, um, and most likely the second one, I think he was preaching or speaking God's desire that this Philippian jailer's family would be saved. And or two, and probably most likely this, was just speaking prophetically about what was about to happen. And we see that in the text, that they went back to his house and his family was indeed saved and they were baptized. Then they go back to the jail. This is a crazy night. They go back to the jail. And that morning, the jailer's like, hey guys, guess what? The authorities heard what went down here, and you're free to go. 
And Paul says, oh, I'm not leaving. They beat me with sticks. They embarrassed us in public. They moved a little too fast. You know why? Because I'm a Roman citizen, and you can't do that to Roman citizens. So why don't you tell those guys they can come over here, and they can come parade me out of jail. And that's exactly what happened. They came, got him out of jail. They apologized to him, which is kind of funny. And then they said, you got to get out of town. And so that's what Paul did. Paul and Silas and Luke, they, after making a pretty big statement for the Lord and seeing Lydia and this Philippian jailer and his family converted, the very end of chapter 16, they go to, uh, back to Lydia's house. They inspire and encourage the believers, and then they pack up and they go on. So that gets us to chapter 17, where Paul and Silas wind up in a place called Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica was a pretty important city. It was about 100 miles from Philippi, where they just were, and it was the capital of Macedonia. And Paul walked there. Now, Thessalonica was located on a really important road, and that road connected the eastern and western empires, and it was on this road called the Via Agnesia. And uh, this was all part of Paul's strategy. So Paul kind of walked through the, you know, hick towns, if you will. No offense to maybe Greenville, Georgia. But he wound up in the thriving metropolis of Noonan, Georgia. Probably Atlanta, actually. But Paul goes to these metropolitan areas uh, strategically to preach the gospel. And, and, we, and we actually see this in 1 Thessalo, Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians as he's writing back later. Um, he says, for you became an example to all of Macedonia. From you, the word of the Lord sounded forth. So he goes to this strategic place, begins to infuse it and share the gospel and from there, he's counting on the word of the Lord spreading out. Um, but I want to start with, uh, with, with, this, with this verse in the first part of uh, chapter 17. It says, now when they had passed through Am Amphilopolis and Apoll Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Those were the two hick towns that I mentioned. Where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and as was his custom, and on, three Sabbath, on the three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and providing that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So Paul goes into the synagogue and he reasons with people. And I think that's an important takeaway for us. Our faith, your faith in the Bible is a reasonable faith. It's not a pie in the sky faith. I mean, um, I can certainly speak from my experience, but we just, we just heard from, from Devin. Like, there's nothing unreasonable that I heard there. I mean, a person who is in desperate need of Jesus, just like we all are, and he meets us where we are, and he walks us through these life experiences, and we have this book called the Bible, grounded in historical fact, that leads us to this place of Jesus being the Son of God and the Savior for our sins. Paul shares this in Thessalonica, and we see in verse 4 that there's a strong reaction. Some of them were persuaded, and some of them joined, and um, uh, but some, some were not. And in the, the span of about three weeks, Paul's got a church going in Thessalonica. So, you know, another point to us. There, there was no cultural index study, no website campaign, no giving campaign. They just, we just went out and shared the gospel. I think that's, again, like, Let's not overcomplicate it. So that's Paul in Thessalonica, setting the stage in this critical city 
Um, then Paul and Silas and Timothy, they go on to Berea where they proclaim the gospel some more. Um, but the haters that ran them out of town in Thessalonica follow them to Berea. And the believers in Berea are like, Paul, you got to get out of town. You got to get out of here. Um, so some people carry him on. Silas and Luke stay behind in Berea, and Paul is carried on all the way to Athens. And this is some of my favorite text in all the scripture. Um, So start with me uh, in chapter 17, verse 16, where Paul winds up in Athens. It says, now Paul was waiting for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace and every day with those who happened to be there. Now, Athens was the heart of the Greek empire. Now, the Greek empire had been conquered by the Romans in 146 BC. Um, So technically it was a Roman colony, but given all of the historical context and significance of Athens, it was, it was given a free designation. And so there was a lot of free thought and free ideas uh, that were going around here. And Paul was incredibly bothered, though, by what he saw in Athens. He saw a city that had been given over to idolatry. There was something like 30,000 idols being worshipped in the city of Athens. A a Greek philosopher once said, it's easier to find a god in Athens than a man. Like it was just a place of idol worship. And so Paul does um, a couple of things. He, He confronts people in the synagogues. He goes to the religious market, to the religious uh, uh, place. He goes to the marketplace, and then ultimately he goes to the Areopagus. And um, I, I think it's really interesting the way that Paul does this. So number one, he confronts religious culture. He went to those people who were believers, who believed in the scripture, but they were missing one critically important fact, and that, that, that's that Jesus Christ was the way. So he goes to the religious culture and speaks to them there. Then he goes to the marketplace and confronts the civic culture. And and he does that with, the Bible says, whoever happened to be there. Well, Well, who happened to be there? Well, people like Stoic and Epicurean philosophers happened to be there. And and they said things like, um, what does this babbler have to say to us? Like he was not afraid to go out there and and preach the gospel and share what he believed in a place that was uncommon to him and, and unfriendly, if you will, to this new thing that he was speaking of. Because Paul was speaking about Jesus and a resurrection and forgiveness of sins. Like these were these were very uh, foreign ideas. Um, and then ultimately, Paul goes to the Areopagus where he confronts the political culture of the day. And the Areopagus was really the heart of Greek culture. And it was a place where the political leaders and community leaders and thought leaders, like they would gather around and they would talk about the meaning of life and, um, you know, who the, the, next, I- the next great idea was going to be from. Um, and you saw people there like the Epicureans who really believed in randomness and that life was just kind of like a collision of particles. I don't know if that kind of sounds familiar to me. Um, and then you had the Stoics who believed that, you know, life was to be endured and that everything was God. They had a very pantheistic kind of worldview. Um, so these were the people that Paul was, was, running, was running into. And I, I, I want to I talk about this address that he gave at a place at, Areop, at the Areopagus, or a place called Mars Hill. And, and uh, I'm going to read through this, and I'm going I'm to bring us home. It says, so Paul, standing in the midst, this is starting in verse 22. It says, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. He acknowledges up front, you know, who they are as a people. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, and I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, 
What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul's saying, you've, of all the gods, the 30,000 idols and gods that you have in Athens, you've got an altar to one to like, as like a catch-all, like to the, to the one we don't know about. And Paul's fixing to tell him, I know who that is. And I'm about to drop it on you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance overlooked, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demarius and others with them. So I want to talk a little bit about Paul's approach here as I, as I, as I bring it home. So first of all, um, Paul was really um, appropriate and gentle with how he approached the Greeks. He starts off by saying, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. What he didn't say was, I perceive that in every way you are a bunch of pagan worshipers who have got it all wrong and you're headed to hell. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. What Paul does is he reverses the order of how he describes kind of ultimate enlightenment. So if you were a Greek, you believed that everything started with man and worked its way up to God. But obviously Paul starts with God and works its way down to man. There was a Greek philosopher named Protagoras and he kind of summed up the thought of the day very well when he said, man is the measure of all things. And Paul really flips that on his head and he says, uh, starting in verse 24, where he, de where he defines God as the creator, the God who made the world and everything in it. Then he describes God um, as the sustainer, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything in it. Then in verse 26 and 27, Paul defines God as the ruler. And in verse 28, I love this, man. This just shows how well-rounded Paul, Paul was, just working knowledge. Um, when, he, when he says, in him we live and move and have our being, like honestly, I, the first time I ever read that, I thought that was like some old ancient scripture. That's not. That, that's, that, 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 that's, not, that's not it. That, that quote actually comes from a Greek philosopher named Epitomedes, where he, where he once said, we, in him we move and have our being. And then he quotes um, Aratus of Sali right after that, where saying, we are his offspring. And of that offspring, speaking of the god Zeus. I just think it's really cool that Paul not only knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, forwards and backwards, but he had a, a, a working knowledge of the culture around him. And he was able to use that cultural knowledge to guide and direct conversation, to open up opportunities to share the gospel. We should know, at least to some degree, what our culture is about. What are they struggling with? What do they believe? What are the common thoughts of the day? And Paul did that really, really well. And then finally, Paul brings it home by mentioning that God is the judge in verse 31. And he says, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Now, what was the reaction to that? Well, there were three things that happened. Some, some people mocked, they, they rejected. Some people said, 
that's interesting. We'll hear you more about that. They reflected. And then some people received what Paul had to say. And praise God for that. I want to bring all of this home by going back to that tiny verse at the beginning. Probably one of the most underrated verses in all of Scripture. Acts chapter 16, verse 8. So if you'll go back in your Bibles with me, I'd love for you to highlight this. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So Paul's been in an argument. He tried to go one place, God told him no. He tried to go another place, God told him no. And he finds himself in Troas. Why do I love this verse? Because what happens in Troas literally changes the entirety of the world by where it takes the gospel. So because Paul couldn't go back on his second missionary journey to check on the places that he went to before and see how they were doing, God sent him on a new path that ultimately takes the Bible from this near eastern part of the world all the way to Athens, into Europe, and ultimately to Rome. So, my question for you today is, what is your Troas. Have you ever woken up with some bad news? Have you ever tried to do some things that just seemed like God wasn't letting you do? Have you tried to go somewhere or ask for something or tried to get to a place and God just says no? Man, can I just encourage you this morning to like really pay attention in that moment to what God is doing? Because I believe, I believe like it says in Ephesians 2.10 that, that we are God's workmanship and he has a unique plan for each of us. I, I believe strongly that the overwhelming majority of that plan is to bring the gospel hopefully to a place that it might not get to if it weren't for you. Now, ultimately, I believe in the sovereignty of God and that God is going to do what God is going to do, but I also believe that he's inviting us into his kingdom work and to take the gospel to the other parts of the world. So can I encourage you this morning that as you think about and struggle through what God is allowing and isn't allowing and the direction that he's putting on your life and maybe you feel like you know where you're going, maybe you feel like you're stalled out a little bit, can I just encourage you to sit in that moment and ask like, hey God, what are you trying to tell me? Where do you want me to go? Because it just might be a Troas moment for you where you're set on a new direction that you weren't expecting and you bring the gospel to a place that you weren't expecting and you have an impact somewhere that you weren't expecting. And I'm really, really, really glad that Paul wasn't able to go to those first couple places he went to because it meant the gospel went around the world. And what a beautiful picture that is of how God used that and his sovereignty to get us there. So let me wrap us up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father.